Good evening and welcome. Tonight we are going to be going over the history and geography of Algeria. Algeria is the largest country in Africa. It's located in the northern area of Africa in a region known as the Maghreb, which is basically this um, stretch of countries up here on the northern coast, which is also pretty deserty. The countries that Algeria borders are Tunisia, Libya, Niger, Mali, and it borders Morocco and this territory known as Western Sahara, which is a bit of a disputed area, but that's, a, that's to get into when we cover Morocco, not Algeria. Algeria also borders the Mediterranean Sea up here. And as you can see by this map, this section up here is very different from this section up here. For one thing, it's much greener. It's very arable. It's the only part of Algeria that's arable, which means that the land is good for farming. It's also pretty mountainous. The Atlas Mountains stretch through this part of Algeria. This branch of the mountains is known as the Tel Atlas Mountains. There's also the Saharan Atlas Mountains that stretch up over here. And you can see lots and lots of major cities all along the coast here, including the capital city of Algiers, which the country is named after. Um, other big cities that will mention the history include Constantine, there's Anaba, um, Oran is the second largest city. There's just lots and lots and lots of cities. 90% of the population of Algeria lives up here. The remaining 10% is all scattered out down through here. So this area, as you can imagine, you can see part of it here, is part of the Sahara Desert. And this section is pretty much what you Imagine when you think of the Sahara, like big sand dunes stretching as far as you can see, camels, oases, you can see all the little towns here are oases towns or cities, I suppose. Um, but there's also some mountainy regions, most notably the Ahakar Mountains are down here, where we can find the highest point in Algeria, Mount Tahat. And, um, Really, the only thing that really grows down here are date palms. So, Algeria has a big date palm industry. That's pretty much what keeps the major cities along here going. You can also see these big roads slicing right through the desert. Algeria has constructed these long... Well, in um, California, we call them freeways, but they're basically big... I'm about to say interstate, but that's another American term. Um, big roads that stretch across the desert and into the bordering countries so that it's just easier to travel across the desert. And, let me check my notes. That's basically it for geography that I want to mention right now. Other things will pop up in its history. And after I go over that, we'll flip through this book right here and I'll show you lots of pretty pictures because Algeria is actually an incredibly beautiful country. Um, we're going to start in this little mountain range down here. It's called the Tassili Najer. This is where we find some very famous cave paintings from our ancient ancestors. Hominid life or Neanderthal life, what have you, um, existed in this area around the year 200,000 BCE. There's been tools found from 30,000 BCE. Like, it's been a while since... Um, at least man or the, the man-like people that came before us lived in this area. Um, the cave paintings here were painted sometime around 5000 BCE. And um, they're really beautiful. There's a good picture in here of the cave paintings. It's one of the more famous sites in Algeria, in the desert area. The indigenous people of Algeria are the Berbers. And they swept pretty much all throughout the Maghreb. And, um, you know, still there today, the majority of the people in Algeria identify as Arab Berber. Um, 
There are many, many different Berber tribes. We won't get into that today. That's a whole video in and of itself. Um, but many Berber tribes existed mainly in like the Morocco, Algeria area. They would eventually spread out more into Libya. Um, but the first like visitors that came and built cities and stopped by were the Phoenicians, which were, um, they're best known for sailing. Like they were big boat people. So they were from like that end of the Mediterranean, like the very end, like where Lebanon is. And, um, they very famously built a city right here. You can see the remains right here. Carthage was their main city in this corner of the world. I've already covered Tunisia in my series, so you can check that out. Um, but they also built cities in this area. Um, let's see. I know they built Anaba, lots of other cities, mostly around the coastline. Um, and those were mainly for, like, trade with other areas throughout Europe. Um, little, like, stopovers before they sail to other places around the Mediterranean, things like that. The Phoenicians and Berbers did do a lot of trading, but the Phoenicians also, um, forced the Berbers into basically slavery. Um, mainly they forced them into their military to fight their wars for them, which the Berber people were not very happy about whatsoever. There was a big revolt that lasted from 241 to 238, um, in which the Berbers extended their influence over the area. Um, and then Carthage falls. So I covered, um, Hannibal Barca. He has his own biography video. You can find out what happened to the city of Carthage, but long story short, the Romans came and ransacked it, uh, with help from the Berbers also. Um, around that time of Berber expansion and definitely after Carthage fell, um, Berber kingdoms really um, took off and became very influential. There were quite a few, but the one I want to talk about that was in this area was called Numidia. And their uh, most famous king is King Masinissa. And he definitely fought alongside the Romans against the Phoenicians for control. Um, however, in the year 24 CE, the Romans annexed Numidia into their empire. And they built lots of little colonies along the shore. Um, this area was known as the breadbasket of Rome because of the arable land there. And it really thrived until the fall of the Roman Empire. A group of people came from Spain known as the Vandals. And as you can imagine by the name, it's where we get the word vandalized from. They came and ransacked and took over, as barbarian tribes tend to do. Um, eventually, the Byzantine Empire came in. Um, the Byzantine Empire, so if you haven't seen my other videos, I know what happened to Rome. But as Rome fell, it got split into Western Roman Empire and Eastern Roman Empire, with the Eastern Roman Empire pretty much um, succeeding and rising up and being the most prosperous, whereas the Western Roman Empire got ransacked by barbarians. So the Byzantine Empire, or the Eastern Roman Empire, came in and reestablished control. That's why we have a city named Constantine, after Emperor Constantine. And the Byzantines remained in control until the late 8th century, when the Arabs came and took over. The Arabs brought a lot of their culture and their language, of course, but the most important thing they brought was their religion, which was Islam. And Islam is definitely still the major religion in Algeria today, the major cultural influence in Algeria today. Um, they uh, really asserted control in the area. Um, control kind of came and went, but the most prosperous um, Arab dynasty would be the Fatimid dynasty. Fatimid meaning um, descended from Fatima, the daughter of Prophet Muhammad. Um, there were many different dynasties and that were in control of the area. I'm not about to list them all because 
I'm just cutting to the chase here. This is a brief history. Um, it was during the reign of the Zionid Sultanate where we get the Barbary pirates. So, um, as you can imagine by the name, pirates started to spring up around the coast and they got along well with the Sultanate at the time. They mainly went after Spanish ships, so Spain retaliated big time and invaded and um, took over, partially took over many of the cities along here between the years 1505 and 1511. Eventually the Ottoman Empire got involved and they helped fund the like revenge attack against them led by a man named Barbarossa, which is what he's most famously known throughout history as. And Barbarossa was rewarded with basically control over the area as allowed by the Ottoman Empire. And, you know, just for future world leaders out there who might be listening to this, don't let pirates take control of your territory. Just putting that out there. The Barbary pirates did what pirates do, right? They continued to raid, get wealthy off of raiding ships, and they got really, really wealthy, they learned, after taking hostages. They would capture prominent Christians, hold them hostage until the countries they belong to, like, you have to pay to get them back. Um, they sold a lot of slaves also. They would go to many islands in the Mediterranean along the coast. The farthest they sailed was even to Iceland and to the Faroe Islands, like way up near the Arctic, to capture slaves. And they did. They managed to capture some slaves from Iceland um, and sell them to areas down here throughout the Sahara. Um, they became very wealthy off of that. But the European powers obviously were not very pleased by this, and they were very tired of paying for ransoms all the time. The French, the French, the Spanish, um, attacked multiple times against the pirates. Um, there was an Anglo-Dutch resistance, that was the one that would eventually weaken them, but the reason they became weak is that they started going after the Americans, and the Americans launched the Barbary Wars against them, which... Uh, the U.S. Navy at the time really wiped out theirs. So when the um, Anglo-Dutch Armada, I suppose, naval force came in to stop them, that pretty much wiped them out. But what really put the nail in the coffin for the Barbary pirates were the French. See, I was coming back to the French. Um, it's a very odd story. So conflict with the French started due to um, the Sultan at the time having a disagreement with a French diplomat and hitting him with a fly swatter. And France decided that was grounds for declaring war. And they um, captured Algiers in 1830. They had complete control over Algeria by 1875. And how they got complete control is pretty horrific. It is classified by most people as a genocide. Um, they wiped out one third of the population of Algerians from either violence or diseases that they brought from Europe. Um, once France had total control, they made it an overseas department of France. Um, many tens of thousands, French, European, uh, Spanish, Italian, um, immigrants, I suppose, moved into the area bringing their culture and influence with them and the French language, which is still the official language of Algeria. And it became like a tourist hotspot for Europeans, like the exotic end of the Mediterranean Sea, I suppose. And of course, the native Algerians at the time were the ones dealing with all the economic burdens that come with turning an area into a tourist place, I suppose. Um, they obviously did not like the French for quite a minute. When World War II happens, of course, Nazi Germany invades France. The territory came under control of the uh, Vichy French government, which was the, like, kind of like puppet state, Nazi-controlled French government. They were liberated by the Allies in 1942. 
And then after the war in 1945, the Algerians were like, okay, enough. Like, we don't want to be part of France anymore. And during a peaceful protest, a really horrible massacre happened. Um, I, I've already kind of glossed over some of the atrocities the French committed on Algerians. But I just want to note that on my channel, we gloss over situations like that, not to diminish them or make light of them, but I'm here to relax you, not stress you out. So, um, we touch on moments like this and just move along so that we don't have to stress out over it. But this was a bad one. It left anywhere from 6,000 to 30,000 dead. It's what really sparked off a um, war against the French. It, um, really took off in 1954 when the National Liberation Front formed, or the FLN. They had a big push for independence. France pushed back even harder, which is what really sparked the whole Algerian war. The um, civilians of Algeria were caught in the middle. Many tens of thousands lost their lives through many horrible ways, which we won't get into because this is to relax you. But it ended with France allowing Algeria to have a referendum on whether or not they should become independent. They voted in 1962 for independence, and they became an independent government country on July 5th, 1962. Um, but the horrors weren't done yet. First of all, the Europeans that were living there fled back to Europe. The ones who didn't were basically massacred. So... Yeah, that was a big to-do. It was pretty awful. Um, the first president of Algeria was the leader of the Ephelin. His name was Ahmed Ben Bella. Um, his favorite thing, besides being overthrown, I'm getting ahead of myself, um, one of the most notable parts of his time as president was the Sand War with Morocco. Um, Morocco essentially was really trying to draw lines, as you can see, it's still a contentious issue, but they were trying to claim this part of what is now Algeria. Algeria fought back. It wasn't a long war, but it ended with these borders being drawn with Morocco. It's more important in Moroccan history than Algerian history, but, um, yeah, just a note. Um, so like I said, Ben Bella was overthrown by a man named Huari Boumedien, and he had a big push for socialism in the country, and particularly in industries like agriculture and oil extraction, which um, really made Algeria prosperous until it wasn't. In the 1980s, the price of oil plunged and collapsed. Um, which is bad news for a country that's dependent on oil revenue. There are many revolts, protests against the government, and the government tried to ease the, the tensions of the people by allowing some changes. Um, one of them was to allow a multi-party government, because at the time it was just a single party. Um, one of the groups that were created during these revolts was known as the Islamic Salvation Front, or the FIS. So they essentially became a political party. So when Algeria held elections in 1992 with all these new political parties, um, they were doing two rounds of elections. The first round, the FIS um, really won big. And the government was worried because the FIS wasn't like an extremist Islamic group and they were afraid that they were going to turn Algeria into a theocracy, like a super strict, super Sharia country. So they canceled the elections. They declared a state of emergency. Violence ensued. The government responded with violence. Um, militias sprang up to fight against the government. Um, it's known now as the Algerian Civil War. There was a ceasefire declared in 1997, but it didn't officially end until 2002. Um, in 1999, another election was held in Algeria, and they elected President Abdelaziz Bouteflika. And, um, quite an interesting character, historical, historically, I suppose, looking back on his time as president. 
Um, he was one of those leaders that somehow just kept getting elected and wow, what a shock. He somehow wins again. And then, oh, let's change the constitution to add another term. And he mysteriously wins that one. He was one of those leaders. Um, however, unlike leaders that keep magically getting elected to multiple terms, um, he was a little different in that he had many different health crises. Um, I don't think it was ever officially confirmed. I think it was just like an ulcer or something they said, or I forget, but it was eventually figured out that he had stomach cancer in 2008. He had a really major stroke in 2013, among various other health complications that come with those types of illnesses. Um, he would just not be in the public eye because he was so unwell. He would actually go for years without being seen by the public. I think the longest stretch was like two years. Um, like events were canceled because of his health, all those kind of things. So when, um, he announces in 2019 that there's going to be another term, people were not very happy. Um, there was already a moment during the Arab Spring when people took to the streets and protested like many other Arab countries did. Um, there were a few changes to the government due to those strikes, but, um, you know, one of the big reasons that the Arab Spring protests happened in Algeria was because Bouteflika would keep getting elected president. So when it happened again, people were very mad this time and there were huge protests to the point where Putiflika resigned in April 2019. Um, more recently, at the end of 2019, they elected Abdel Majdid Tebun. Um, it's been a bit of a rocky um, term with him. I mean, the events of 2020 doesn't really help. He's been making subtle changes to the government and the constitution, things like that. There have been protests against him. Um, he did get COVID at one point and has had many complications due to that. So, you know, that doesn't help. And honestly, that's about where we are in the history. It's one of those instances where he's either going to actually turn things around or not. And he's just going to wind up getting replaced later on. We shall see. Um, I imagine it's very difficult to take over a government like that. Um, but Algeria, like I said, is a gorgeous country. And the people there are the ones that I've, like, I haven't talked to, but, like, read their accounts about living there. They seem quite lovely. So let me show you some pictures of beautiful Algeria. First of all, we have these gorgeous camels this happy guy here. Let me show you. Isn't that beautiful? This is a Tuareg woman. It says it's an ethnic group that lives down in the Ahagar region of Algeria. So yeah, this is what do you expect when you think of Sahara Desert, right? Like camel caravans and the sand and the heat, things like that. The political map of Algeria. Here is a market in a Sahara town. You can see a big minaret over here, the bazaar, very gorgeous. Here is a oasis garden, it says. You can see the date palm trees back there, tending to his crops. Here are the ruins of a Roman city, found all throughout the Roman territories in Algeria. Another example of what the desert looks like, just sand, rocks, as far as the eye can see. A physical map of Algeria where you can see pretty much all the action happens up here and all of this is just desert. But look how gorgeous the coastline is. Get beautiful the water. And these are the Atlas Mountains. So you can see very like craggy, but still very green. Here's some gorgeous sand dunes. 
we've got um, one of the few rivers that flow through Algeria. This is the Rumel. Here's a picture of an oasis out in the desert. An oasis, I suppose. And this is at a hot spring where the uh, limestone and um, salt mixing with the rock creates this really gorgeous um, feature. It's really pretty. Gorgeous beach along the shore. We've got some pictures of cities here. This is in Oran and this is in Constantine. Very rare rainy day. And some of the sandstorms that pretty much happen yearly. Um, Algeria is occasionally hit with earthquakes. These are macaques. Is the only monkey species in North Africa, the Barbary macaque. Some donkeys getting some shade. That's cute. The national animal of Algeria, the fennec fox, one of my favorite animals. They're so beautiful, aren't they? Look how cute. Oh gosh, a scorpion. Ooh, I hate scorpions. Yuck. There's, of course, camels. Very important for transporting across the desert. The Cuvier's gazelle, which are very endangered, I believe. These gorgeous little horns on their heads. Flamingos, but this is the barb horse. Uh, one of the very beautiful horses, isn't it? One of the horses that are bred in this area. Of course, we have the beautiful flamingos. We have a monk seal, which are also endangered. They're so sweet. Let's see where this is. It looks like it's in Tassili Najer. Tassili Najer National Park. Very beautiful. Here are the cave paintings I was telling you about. Super cool. I love cave paintings. They're so interesting. This is a Numidian tomb. Is there a person up there? There's something up there. What is that? Let's see. Hold on. It is a person. <laughs> That's so cool. That's an awesome tomb. Here you can see the extent of Phoenicia. So you can see they are really up here along the northern coast, with Carthage being their main city. Let's see what this is. Um, a battle against the Carthaginian fleets during the First Punic War. The Punic Wars being the wars between the Phoenicians and the Romans. Oh, this is the extent of Numidia. And the Roman Empire is all in purple, so you can see what they wound up taking over. The red line there says this is the southern boundary of the Roman Empire. Got some more Roman ruins here. There's Barbarossa, who fought for the Turks, I suppose, um, as a pirate lord. Ooh, sorry. Americans fighting the Barbary pirates. And here is a French family that has moved into northern Algeria. And they're very, um, like, French or even Italian countryside looking home. This is Abdelkadir, or Abdelkadir, um, one of the probably the most important fighter against the French. And here we can see the borders of French Algeria. They pretty much had everything by 1934. Algerian soldiers in World War I. And here's an independence rally in 1960. Um, protest during the 1991 election. It says he's holding a Quran there. I wonder what this means. I don't know, but anyway. And here's Abdelaziz Bouteflika. And we have. Oh, these are villagers who were arming themselves against um, other fighters during the Civil War. And this is during the. Arab Spring protests. There's people voting. We have 
Let's see, it says, uh, oh, this is the Prime Minister at the time this book came out. And members of the National Assembly. One of the big changes that um, Bouteflika implemented was to make sure that there were more women representatives in the government. So I always see lots of women mixed in with lots of men. Here is the national flag. Let's read this section. It says, the Algerian national flag features two equal vertical bands of green and white. A red five-pointed star within a red crescent is centered over the boundary of the vertical bands. The colors are symbolic. Green represents Islam, the white denotes purity, and red indicates peace and liberty. The white portion also calls to mind the banner carried by revolutionary leader Abdel Qadir in battles against the French in the 1800s. The crescent and star are Islamic symbols. The flag was flown by a national by the National Liberation Front in 1954 and was officially adopted as the national flag when independence was declared in 1962. Let's see, here's Bitsa um, talking to some new judges, apparently. Waving the flag. We have, let's see, Algerian soldiers guarding a natural gas facility. And here are some pictures of Algiers. Gorgeous city, you can see the water there. A map here of downtown. And this is the Martyrs Monument. It's a very big, big monolith, I suppose. Um, to commemorate those who lost their lives during the independence movement. It's the oil their main source of income. This is an oil rig in 1959, it says. And let's see, this, um, the Sonatrach group, um, it says oversees all oil and gas projects in Algeria. They're building a pipeline here. And let's see, the struggle to find work. I know that um, unemployment has kind of ebbed and flowed over time, especially after all the um, French and the Europeans left because it took a lot of skilled labor away um, since, you know, they didn't allow Alger Algerians to have those kind of jobs, you know? So once they were all gone, it, there was a vacuum there and that never helps with the economy. You can see some of the resources here. You can see the main ones out here at Camels. We've got oil, minerals, but all the big industries up here. Here are some dates being harvested up in the trees. And some sheepies. There's always sheep in these books. Reading the newspaper. Here's an example of what the currency looks like. They use the dinar. This it says Algerian man reads the internet. Wow. Camel crossing. Watch out for camels. Oh, how sweet. What beautiful smiles. So cute. Oh, how gorgeous. Let's see. A population map where you can really see how many people live there compared to out over here. This is a Berber funeral, it says. And this is a Tuareg man. And the men cover their faces culturally. Let's see, some women getting some water, it looks like. Oh, they're coming home from the market. Awesome. And an example of how rural Algerians travel. Um, it says, you know, usually they use trucks and things like that, but donkeys and camels are still useful. This is one of the cool festivals that are held throughout the Sahara, where, like, they go in full regalia. It's, it's awesome. It's, like, um, comparable to, like, a rodeo in America. It's like that. Like how gorgeous this city is. Let's see, this is in the Msab Valley. And all the cities are, or all the cities, all the houses are around the mosque. 
most important part of an Arab city is the mosque because you have to get there a few times a day, especially on Fridays. Berber speaking areas. So, um, the Berber language is one of the official languages of Morocco. It's not the official language of Algeria, that's French, but it is a recognized language, so, um, yeah, it's still like on like road signs and things like that. Here's an example of Arabic script. Let's see, working hard at school. Nobel Prize winning scientist Claude Cohen Tanucci. What did he win for? Dun, 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 dun. Physics. The first person from an Arab country to win the prize. That's awesome. Reading the Quran. Saint Augustine, who was born in what is today Algeria when the Romans were in charge there. It was a very Christian nation before the Arabs came. Like, yeah, it was like a big thing because it was controlled by the Byzantine Empire. Let's see. Looks like we're praying or reading off this big tablet there. That's definitely praying. Sacred sites. Let's see. Let's read this. Why not? says, Algiers is the spiritual as well as the political capital of Algeria, but other cities around the country are also noted holy locales. You know, I didn't look up how to pronounce this city. I think it's Tlemkin? Tlemcen? Anyway, in northwest Algeria has more buildings dating from the 12th to the 15th centuries than any other Algerian community. The Great Mosque, built in 1136, is a well-known landmark. And it lists all the other great landmarks. I'm pretty sure that must be the Great Mosque. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that work in there. The coloring up there. It's very nice. This is Abdel Hamid Ben Badis, um, a leader of the Islamic Reform Movement in Algeria. And we have um, oh, visiting a gravesite and a Jewish cemetery also. Oh, Protestant Berbers worshipping. And here's an imam speaking. And playing some music at a wedding, it says in the caption. Glass bottles dating back to the 7th century BCE. Discovered in Constantine. Here is the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art. It's really gorgeous. It says it was built to be a department store. Like how beautiful, making some carpets. How gorgeous. And this is an oud, a very traditional instrument. Let's see, this is Swad Masi, a musician. And this, oh, it's an example of rye music. Does it say who this is? Sheb Khaled, I believe. Doesn't really say in there. Let's see who this is. Oh, so yeah, there there is an issue with um, journalists getting jailed and outspoken musicians getting jailed, um, especially in the last ten years or so. A movie called The Battle of Algiers about Algerian independence. Albert Camus, a very famous writer who was born in Algeria. And of course, playing their football. And this is um, silver medal winning Tofik Makhloufi. Out at the market, selling some fruits and vegetables. She's making spaghetti. I'm pretty sure spaghetti is one of those dishes that's, at this point, it's just universal. Like, you can find some form of spaghetti everywhere. This guy's using tahine. Yum, yum. And a saffron and raisin couscous. You know, that doesn't look bad. If it weren't for the, the onions there. It looks like onions. But yeah, I like onions, but I like cooked onions. 
this is how they pour their tea in this part of the world. It's very, you know, another universal thing is elaborate tea ceremonies, isn't it? Um, yeah, very beautiful. Sharing a very delicious looking meal. And Domino's, one of my favorite games and also one of Algerian people's favorite games as well. Let's see. Oh, it's the type of veil that's traditionally worn by some people. And it says she just graduated from police academy and celebrating with her mother. And let's see if this is the last one. Getting married, because there's always pictures of weddings in these books. Some really like, gorgeous looking headdresses there, aren't they beautiful? And that's the end of our book. So, close this up some more tea being poured and we'll end it there for the night thank you so much for watching I hope you found this video relaxing and educational I'm going to have one more video on Algeria for you tomorrow and then we're going to hop over to a very different part of Africa for a little bit so be sure to subscribe if you aren't already so you don't miss out on learning some more interesting history the next country, I feel like, is one of those countries that most people don't know even exists. So you're going to learn something cool for sure. I hope you have a very, very good, 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 good.